Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. James Lyons Weiler, coming to you live from the WWDNYK Studios in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. WDNYK Studios, for those of you who don't know, hosts these this podcast, Unbreaking Science, and future podcasts, including Talk Nerdy to Me, which we have some in the queue. Um, and WWDNYK stands for What We Do Not Yet Know Studios. Mm. And we're focused today on a uh, two-hour segment, if not more, if we're lucky, we'll have more, uh, from Dr. Greg Enriquez, who has a fascinating background, a fascinating contribution uh, in academia and in clinical sciences. In his tree of knowledge, it's uh, been around for a while, and I thought I'd bring Dr. Uh, Enriquez in to discuss this in the current context of how this mad, mad, mad world has turned topsy-turvy, and yet it seems like it's the same thing over and over again. Welcome, mm. Dr. Enriquez. How are you? Hey, thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. I'm, I'm doing well. Awesome. Thank you. So I'm going to flash this uh, across the screen here so people know that you are a professor in the doctoral program in clinical school of psychology at James Madison University. And um, you, That's right. you've been there for how many years now? I got there in 2003. I uh, was there uh, in 2005. I became director um, and was director until 2017. Uh, when I stepped out of that, being director is a lot of administrative work, and I've got a lot of uh, theory and other things to share with the world. So I stepped off from there and uh, was able to devote more time to my theoretical work. Well, I have to tell you, having advised graduate students myself and been on advisory committees and so on, you know, um, it's a commendable thing that you did to stand up to the job to hurt all of the cats in that department. I'm not anybody <laughs> in the department, but I know exactly what you must have Well, you can, if you know that hurting cats is, uh, you know, we, we were a pretty good program, but yes, uh, you know, academics, uh, the hurting cats is definitely a good analogy. Absolutely. So let me bring this this diagram up if you don't mind we'll get right into the tree of knowledge and tell us about where it came from what was going on in, in psychology at the time what made you stretch this out so broadly outside from the parochial schools of thought in in psychology alive at the time and and what, what was going on in your in your mind to to, to bring this about Absolutely. Uh, so I'll give you a little bit of background uh, because it, 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 it was a lot less intentional in some ways, uh, or at least I ended in this place uh, in a less intentional way than it might if you know the background story. So let me give it to you. So in the early 1990s, I was in graduate school um, and was very fortunate to have excellent, I was in my master's program, I had excellent instructors. And in my advanced psychotherapy class, I was exposed to sort of the best of the best models in psychotherapy. Um, and when I, I came in thinking that I was more on the science side, you know, and I'd heard that uh, for your listeners, there are things called cognitive behavior therapy, for instance, uh, that are touted as being more scientific. Uh, so that I kind of came in with that idea. And then I learned um, through that, that that's a much, the world's a lot more complicated uh, than that some of the ideas are scientific and good and other ideas that are not. Uh, and that probably is something that resonates with you. Um, but then I actually yeah, got into I actually want to pause there for a minute before we go on, because mm -hmm. what I wanted to say is my impression as an outsider to psychology and reading widely in psychology, both in the, the literature and in books, historical books. And I love it when somebody in, a, say, 1960 says, this is psychology. 1970 mm -hmm. says, this is psychology. 1980 yeah. says, this is psychology. Um, I've watched it evolve from, you know, the phenomenological Freudian, yep. you know, mm -hmm. you did this because of this motivation kind of, yep. you know, armchair thing and into something that we can get into to where it hit a brick, it hit a ceiling, it hit a, a, a brick wall. Definitely. Where it should have evolved out of the soft sciences, in my view, from a phenomenological um, uh, investigation, which provided mirrors into what people were thinking, reflections, <laughs> but it, the, the mechanistics of, of biological psychiatry 
there's mm -hmm. little fits and starts here over the course of the decades where people are just getting at root causes, right? Like, mm -hmm. what, what's going on in the brain from a physiological standpoint, the physiological state, as play, you know, the, 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 the roles of hormone balance, the roles of you know, right. things that we, sure. we now know better, but we still don't yet have a full grasp of. Uh, mm -hmm. they, we know that they're important, but we can't necessarily predict exactly what's going to go on in somebody's head given a certain set of inputs right and that's Clearly. A good thing. that's a good thing they don't want to no. necessarily be able to program so much but nevertheless i didn't mean to interrupt so much but what, what, no, we, want to, right. what we want to tell is that the psychology itself is a is, is a fluid river of right. inquiry with different that's personalities right. coming into it just like any other science with different frames of view different theories different predominant models um and so you were motivated given the best uh, you know, th three or four ways of looking at psych psychology, uh, which were, I guess, not reconcilable with each other. Is that right? Right. So, and, and my first thing is I'm in the therapy room. So, I, so I'm a very, you know, um, I'm driven by coherence, sort of big picture coherence. That's where my mind goes. Um, I'm going to become a therapist. Uh, I want to have access to the best available knowledge uh, so that I can help people. And then I learned that the best available, the best of the best is distributed through all these different paradigms. A paradigm is a model, a way of thinking. So you have the behavioral paradigm, uh, which actually has its probably closest roots to biology in some ways. Um, you then have a cognitive paradigm, and they sort of get together to create the CBT paradigm. But actually, if you understand the theory of those two uh, at a sort of deeper level, uh, one is behavioral and one's mental, and they actually don't go together super well. You also have the updated versions of Freud, um, uh, which there are a lot of very sane, interesting things uh, that come off of the psychodynamic view. Uh, that's important. You have really what I came to see is sort of the best psychotherapy starts with Carl Rogers and the humanistic tradition. Um, and these are the individualistic approaches. So you also have very, very intelligent things being said by family therapists. Um, you have feminists come along and, and other sort of multicultural perspectives that emphasize the socio-historical context and issues of power and privilege, which of course are very salient in our consciousness now. Um, and all of those things have interesting, powerful things to say. Uh, yet when you zoom back, they get fuzzier and fuzzier because their core insights and their language and their fundamental starting places are all different. And there isn't any overarching view of the landscape. Uh, instead, all you have these different mountains, I often will say, there's no view of the mountainside. It's like an adaptive, uh, that, it's an adaptive landscape, which we'll, we'll get yeah. into later. Well, we'll soon. get right, right, yeah. right. If we think about it as if we think about it as sort of a paradigms of adaptive landscapes, there's no view of the mountain, we can use this, well, I'll use adaptive landscapes in a different way when we come back to your point. Sure. So then I, so then I was like, well, if we look at medicine, sort of modern Western medicine, you know, there are a lot to be interesting things to say about alternative medicine. But if we look at modern Western medicine, you see the organ systems, you know, we see all these specialties uh, and they're fairly well organized into then a generalist medical practitioner, which is then anchored in the science of human biology, you know, physiology, anatomy, all of that. Mm -hmm. And you don't have uh, medical doctors competing and saying, oh, the key to good health is cardiology. Everything's about your heart and blood. Or, and then somebody else come along and say, no, it's the hormones that matter. You know? And then somebody says, no, it's the digestive tract. You know? um, no, it, we have an understanding of these as different organ systems that are tied together by an un overarching understanding of human biology. Okay? So what happened to me is I was like, well, here are all these different perspectives in the psychotherapy world. Why don't we anchor them all to the science of human psychology uh, so that we could then say, well, here's the descriptive explanatory frame of understanding human psychology. And then here are the broad applications uh, of that. Uh, when I did that, I realized that what the, I had been a psychological ma psychology major, but it didn't really dawn on me. When I asked, well, what is human psychology? Uh, then I tell, you know, I can be a little crass about this. Then I realize actually no one knows what the F psychology is. Um, and, and what I mean by that is I think you have your background in biology. So if you look at, you know, why do we call the hard sciences hard sciences? And, and it is certainly there's a lot of debate, a lot of, uh, a lot of very contentious debate, profound mysteries and disputes. Right. But what you get in the hard sciences of physics, chemistry, and biology is a consensual core of agreement 
around the basic terms and foundational insights. For example, the, uh, the uh, periodic table of the elements, okay, provides a foundational core for uh, atomic physics into chemistry. And, and, and that's, you know, uh, and we have the standard model of elementary particle physics and general relativity and Newtonian mechanics. We have uh, the broad view of evolution uh, and natural selection and genetics and cell theory. Uh, and we know that although there's, you know, is a COVID virus alive, we know what we mean by life in general, okay? Well, that level of soci it's really sociological coherence of the scientists, right. that level then uh, dissolves completely when you get to psychology. So let me um, end on that first one second. And I thought mm -hmm. the reason why these other things were called hard sciences at the time was that the, the firmaments that you're talking about, the, the, the basic background assumptions, uh, mm -hmm. like you said, the vocabulary and so on, mm -hmm. a lot of it was based on experiment. Experiment. Yes experiment hardcore experiment with you know controls and you know observational data was seen as the start of that's it, not exactly. the end mm -hmm. and Clearly. so whenever we see a situation where a paradigm has to for or it has historically based its understanding of what they call knowledge and what they say acceptable knowledge is based on observation it's subject mm -hmm. to all kinds of biases observational Absolutely. studies like uh ecology like ecology for instance there are, i got mm -hmm. frustrated with ecology i have a phd in ecology evolution and conservation biology and as a master's student at ohio state university my my thesis that i wrote i did my the last year of my studies there without my direct uh, without my advisor paul colombo because he had gone mm -hmm. off to to stry mm -hmm. I, my, the ba the basic conclusion was there's so many possible explanations for the patterns that i'm seeing in this e ecological data that we can't put our firm we can't know anything at that point right and it could be any of them it could be a mixture of them it could you know right? and so with the absence of randomized prospective clinical trials and so on um, mm -hmm. you know we have psychology and then we have the pharmacological uh, it's kind of like uh, other cousin if you will yep, of yep. psychiatry right mm -hmm. so those, those, those. I'm sure you're going to get into how those relate to each other oh, in view, because you go from quantum physics all the way, you know, through, you know. All, so we'll get to that. But I really appreciate that at, at that young age, you not only saw an opportunity, you saw kind of a duty, as from what I can see from your devotion, and passion about it, um, to reconcile, to find a way to help psychology become coherent. Right, uh, right, and in a manner that would help people, and those those words help people was very were very very key in 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 my um, my understanding of, of why this is so cool. So go go from where you are now. You've got okay. you've got right, the soft so. sciences kind of mm -hmm. disparate thinking fragmentation, and and then now you're going to pull it all together. So what was right. your first first uh, so, kind of epiphany there? So the first epiphany, I, I sort of. Uh, dove in wasn't really my own, but I did, uh, the emerging on the scene was evolutionary psychology, okay? Um, and people were taking notions of the modern evolutionary synthesis, and they were looking at the mind in the, in the, through the human mind, uh, through this particular lens. Um, and I was fascinated. I was actually sort of raised on a, uh, both kind of a combination of feminism and behaviorism uh, that made me much more ignorant uh, than I should have been about evolutionary biology um, and its history uh, and its power uh, when it's at least properly applied. Um, so I actually became enamored in 1995 uh, with evolutionary psychology and was thinking, as the evolutionary psychologist of the time, uh, I thought that they may have had their hands around a potentially uh, unifying version of psychology. Now, I then, in 1996, however, by the time I absorbed all that information and was, I mean, I was, uh, I was not a geek in high school. I skipped a lot of class and smoked a fair amount of weed. Um, but by the time I was a graduate student, now I will say I was pretty much a geek full time. You were talking about, you know, talk nerdy to me. I, I can relate to that. And, uh, so I was absorbing a lot of information. Um, and I was doing my I had done my master's degree on a social psychological experiment. I was doing my dissertation on Beck's cognitive errors. Aaron Beck is a famous um, psycho actually he's a psychiatrist. Uh, he's famous in psychology for founding cognitive psychotherapy. Um, 
I was now then getting trained in psychodynamic psychotherapy in terms of my actual uh, clinical practicum. And it was the intersection of those things uh, that uh, caused me to have my first real key insight in late of 1996, um, which then uh, set me on this track uh, to develop this unified framework. So what was that? So, you know, I was learning how to think like an evolutionary biologist. Um, and if you think about evolutionary psychology, one of the things about the human mind that's really remarkable uh, is the way it uses language. Uh, now, other animals engage in very sophisticated forms of communication, but human symbolic syntactical language um, is a different kind of communication system uh, in a whole host of different ways. Um, and many people basically think of the question as, well, what were the evolutionary forces that gave rise to this uh, capacity. Okay, so you got bigger skulls, and you got us eating meat, and you got us cooperating, you have us able to imitate, and there are a huge number of really fascinating arguments and ideas that give rise to the evolution of language. Okay, um, but my situation as a clinical psychologist, I actually then developed a very uh, interesting view of language. Everybody talks about how advantageous language is, which it is, uh, in terms of kind of creating cognitive gadgets, uh, sharing information cheaply, uh, imagining the future. It does all that stuff, allows you for self-recursive self-reflection, does that really cool. But one of the things that language really creates is what I call, it creates the problem of justification. Okay. Mm -hmm. So once you evolve to the point where you have propositional language, okay, so if I say there, antelope, all right, you and I are working together in a tribe, you have a sense about what I mean, but there's no way to really challenge that statement. I can either go with you, I can sort of, but I can't engage that in a level of analysis about knowledge. However, when you say the antelope are over there, okay, now I can call BS, no they're not, they're over here, okay, or how do you know that? Now, the reason okay. why, for the listeners, the reason why this is so important is because as he's describing this, I'm thinking about communication systems and animals in animal mm -hmm. behavior where the information is, so far as we can tell, communicated, but the subtle context is not. So there's, there's yes. a bit more of an autopilot. So if you walk out oh, in your yeah. backyard and you hear the birds chirping, guess who they're talking about? They're talking about right. you. They're no getting doubt. alert that there's this big, large, smelly thing coming out of the back of the house. and. We don't know. Is it saying we don't know its intentions? It's how many are there? We don't know exactly the full context, but we know in the analysis of the information that comes out of that, those animals' uh, beaks, that there is some attempt at direction. There is some attempt at level of threat. There is some attempt at, at that kind of communication. Oh, definitely. But it's not anywhere as nearly as specific as human language. Right. And, and human language gives rise to a dual layer problem of justification. First, there's the analytic problem. And really, it's an analytic in a social pragmatic way. Later, it becomes a formal analytic problem in civilization. And I can talk about that. But the social anal is like, okay, now you're actually claiming. So what we don't think birds do do is like, you say, oh, there's a fat, smelly guy coming out and it's going to kill us. Okay. And then you're then like, well, how do you know that? Or birds don't say that. Okay. They just, right. they just will listen to that. All right. And there's a um, lot of overhead to their survival if they do sit around and debate. And Paul Colombo, mm -hmm. who was my uh, postdoctoral advisor, had a theory of the evolution of uh, uh, intelligence. Uh, and well, never made to the, I use the word theory loosely, but the mm -hmm. sure, so this idea that, that the reason why we have religiosity in our species is because it was too metabolically expensive to sit around under a tree in the savanna trying to wonder why your family, you know, fell off a cliff or something. You're never going to yep. figure it out with 300 cc's of gray matter. You're just not going to figure out all the mechanics and probabilities and risks. You're going to show, oh, there was, a, there was a, a bird that flew overhead, and it was a blackbird, yeah. and that's an <laughs> omen. And so I must have done something wrong. I mean, it gets animism and all right. this other stuff, right? So right. it's right. fascinating well, I... to think. Exactly. So, and in fact, I would argue that there's good evidence that once you have the problem of justification, then you have... And one of the things about it that, the, that I emphasize is it's a lot easier to ask about justification uh, than to solve it. In other words, it doesn't take, just hang out with a three or four-year-old precocious kid. They'll be like, why? What? 
Where? How do you know? Why are you bald? You know, why is the sky blue? All right. And, and exacerbator parents will say, just because it is, right? And what that shows you is it doesn't take much cognitive load to ask questions. Right. Um, it just takes a lot of load to answer them, yes. okay? Right. And so what, what, what I emphasize, we got this problem of justification, and ultimately that's going to set in motion religiosity because religiosity is good. You're going to be backed up into answering why questions, and the narrating, storytelling, pattern-matching human mind is going to start to create narrative and we're going to need to be coordinated and the combination of need for coordination need for narrative need for meaning is going to set the stage for these systems of justification that are going to have uh, at the oral indigenous level uh, an animistic flavor of a uh, uh, group in relationship to nature and, right. and, so and that's what we see so we're kind of genetically hardwired because it's if it's inexpensive i was just talking about this last last in the last episode um about how it, we're lazy. We're kind of hardwired to be intellectually lazy because it's mm -hmm. physiologically expensive to write a whole di doctoral dissertation on, you know, <laughs> what we're going to have for dinner, right? It's just not. Right. It doesn't work. And yeah. it, with today's society, we have we have so much um, ease. We have so much convenience that right. we have. We're, we are overbuilt for the level of convenience that we have to make our to make our way through any given day. Completely, completely, completely overbuilt, overdesigned, and yet we still have these trappings, these 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 um, inher inherited traits of our Pleistocene ancestors. Where if we see an elderly person, we assume that that person has some much more insight, much mm. more experience. And these days, that's kind of fading away. Right, because we're going for the what's going to happen in the next fifteen seconds is the most important yep. thing. And this old person doesn't know how to access what happened in the last fifteen seconds. So the commodity, the value of the commodity of experience is eroding from our society in a big, big way. And we do well, value yeah. the overly as a result. That's a huge yeah, that gets into so the acceleration of change and then the gap between the generations is a big issue about why we're very vulnerable to going crazy. Um, how, what we need to learn from the past generations in terms of the traditional wisdom and what is going to be so novel about the digital age that we're entering into and getting that balance correct okay, is very, very key uh, to us transitioning into the world that is emerging successfully. So yeah, that's and I a, think there's a rational way to think about it. The people that have access to, to knowledge are not necessarily wise in its application. Mm -hmm. um, there are times to take action and times not to take action, and sometimes the right thing to do is nothing, and that's a big lesson. But what we have now is at, at lateral access to the equivalent of uh, thousands of years of scientific research or thousands of years of, you know, tits on tick, TikTok, whatever you want to access, you could go totally. in either direction. And so being able to, you know, grab as much information as a person would have it all in their lifetime in basically a week. That's just information, how to put it together right. in a useful and constructive manner. That takes guidance, that takes wisdom, and that takes experience. And so, you know, as I said, the best thing I can say is listen to your mother because she learned from her mother and who learned yeah. from her mother. And they, That's they, right. they, they carry it on. But we're going a little bit far afield. I want to go okay. back to the tree of life. So anyway, how, how many so of your you... subdomains did you get to so far? You have the biological... Right. Uh, so, well, the, I mean, the tree of, uh, right, the tree, tree of knowledge, of knowledge sorry. Uh, is dividing the, uh, ultimately, it divides ontic reality. It's a, it is a theory of scientific reality. It divides it into four planes of existence or dimensions of behavioral complexity. Uh, so you see that here. The base is matter. There's a material dimension of complexity. And then nested inside of that, but also in some ways, importantly, operating in a supervenance above it is life. Um, uh, and that, that consists of cells and, and plants uh, and all the other animal king, all the other kingdoms except animals. Um, mind is mediated by the nervous system and brain in general and corresponds to the dimension of animal behavior. So that's a very, very tricky part about the language system. How do we talk about mind? Uh, and I have a many, I, a part of the theory is the way to disentangle our confusion about what mind is. Um, but mind with a capital M on the tree of knowledge is the third dimension of behavioral complexity or third plane of existence. And it corresponds to the behavior of animals as wholes mediated uh, by the brain. Um, and so there's that 
Um, and then you have what was, culture. What, hey, let, me, let me ask you, what would mind with a, with a capital M contrast mind with a capital M to uh, mind with a lowercase m? What do you, what do you mean? Okay. By that? Well, actually, what I, uh, the, 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 when we use the term mental process in psychology, the argument is, is that fundamentally there are really three different definitions of mind that are nested in that cluster of mental processes that need to be disentangled. Okay, one is the neurocognitive functionalist view of mind. The neurocognitive functionalist view interprets the brain as a neuroinformation processing system that is coordinating the behavior of the animal as a whole. Okay, so that's one definition. So I have fish over here. All right, uh, you can't see them, but you can imagine there they are just swimming around. Uh, okay, so they're be they have uh, vertebrate bodies uh, in a brain eyes, they're moving, looking around, moving all around. I go up there, I drop fish uh, food into their tank, okay? They swim to the top as a function of the neurocognitive informational architecture, their learning history, their evolutionary history, etc. I would actually say, instead of, oh, those fish are alive, I would actually say, oh, look at, they're mental, okay? And that you can see. It's a behavioral definition of mind, if you're familiar with like some philosophical arguments like Gilbert Ryle, all right? Mm -hmm. uh, so the first definition of mind is a behavioral definition that engages a neurocognitive functional architecture. And this is what the behaviorists were trying to say, uh, what they mean, okay? So, so, so that would be in contrast to the pilot in a cockpit model, let's say. So to mm -hmm. try to understand what you're right. talking about, that there's right. a... That, that the mind is the organ or part of the organ of con the seat of consciousness or is, is the seat of consciousness as opposed to an internal us which is watching ourselves doing something because there is no internal us under this mind theory of capital M mind. Right. It's a, kind of like well, an integrative self. Okay, so yes, yeah, so it's, and right now, all right, so there's actually, the th let me just lay out the three different. So what yeah. is a neurocognitive functional architecture, um, which by the way, doesn't necessarily mean anything about the second definition of mind, which is the sub, uh, which is the subjective phenomenological experience of being, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Subjective awareness There's a famous book called, What Is It Like to Be a Bat by mm -hmm. Nagel, okay? And we presume that bats do have a subjective experience of being, um, I think there's good reason to believe that. It's very hard to know exactly what it is like to have that subjective experience, okay? And then the question is, where does that subjective experience come from? Because the neurocognitive architecture can do a lot of behavior without it, all sure. right? And whether or not my fish have a phenomenology, I think probably, but not a huge one, whether a worm, a nematode with 302 neurons has one, I doubt it. And I don't think trees have a phenomenological experience of being either, okay? Right. So, so, so phenomenology is the second definition of mind. Um, and then the third definition is the self-conscious narrator that feeds back on phenomenology and is accessible to other people that speak the language. Like right now, my third dimension of mind is going through my skin, through my verbal behavior, through this, uh, you know, information interface and into your ears and your dialoguing about it. So our self-conscious minds actually connect through the intersubjective space. Um, our, our second mind is actually contained in our subjectivity. And our first level of mind is a neurocognitive functionalist view uh, of animal behavior writ large. So that little question, which was really easy to ask, what is a mind with a capital M? <laughs> it was a great explanation. It took you a long time to explain it, yeah. but it's a great example, right? So this the, 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 my, my, my viewership is fairly well familiar with the uh, autonomic system and the difference okay. between the autonomic system and um, you know the mm -hmm. the um, I'm, I, I just drew a blank but nevertheless the point is there's a lot that central go, sorry the central nervous system central and nervous the, system the, yes that's, that's right but what my point is we, we could do a, we can get a lot we, we do a lot in the course of our day on autopilot Absolutely. Where, where we're not aware of what we're doing, where we are aware of what we're doing, and where, where we're barely aware of what, we, what we're doing. And, and there's muscle memory. We call it muscle memory and all the rest. Um, your understanding of the role in psychology of, in society is obviously influenced by placing it in the context of using scientific information 
and we're going to get into you know the behavioral investment theory in a big way i think today uh in this because you wanted to you started off by wanting to help people and you saw a lot of things that were not being used that were valuable that could die in the tree of knowledge in, in, the, the, if one of these paradigms uh, uh persisted over at the expense of the others i think you were a little bit nervous that hey wait a minute what if this kind of falls out of fashion because of fashion sure. not because it wasn't well founded so right. I, you have a full grasp of of where you're going with this so in 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 mind you also discuss this behavioral investment theory which i think is a really interesting place to start everyone should start reanalyzing politics from behavioral mm -hmm. investment theory in terms right. of what other people are doing and in terms of what they're doing why they prefer things in a particular way as yep. in terms of being self-aware in terms of addressing the limitations that you're allowing yourself to explore a certain landscape or not so why don't you talk a little bit about behavioral investment theory and how you brought that into this as a key component of uh the role Absolutely. of mind in the tree of knowledge Yes. Um, so just so we're following, I was talking at, at the culture level. Okay. So the mm -hmm. culture person is the talking level. That's the jump from our primate history into our person history. Okay. So when we were talking about talking, that's that culture dimension. Now yeah. we're dropping down into the animal mind dimension. Right. Okay. And, and behavioral. I think that's right where we need to be to help people yeah. in society today. Amen. You want to yeah. understand. Okay. So Behavioral investment theory is about how the animal mind emerges out of the dimension of life, all right? And what it does is it takes B.F. Skinner. So B.F. Skinner, um, a very complicated, interesting character, um, but he, he, he developed a very sophisticated model about reinforcement and what's called behavioral selection, actually modeled it right off of natural selection. And what he said was that you emit a number of possible behavioral and activity, some of those activities have particular consequences, some of which are rewarding or reinforcing, and those contra, uh, consequences then get selected for. And then other things are punishing or, or not, don't result in the kinds of consequences that you want, and they are selected against. Uh, and, and your repertoire of behavioral capacities is a delicate function of this feedback loop. Okay? And I think he's absolutely right. Um, and what are you actually trying to do? At one point, B, uh, Skinner called this process in his early years a form of commerce with the environment. Okay, So a form of commerce means that you're spending energy, time, calories, possible risk to get to consume some benefit. Okay, right. and, and you want it, according to behavioral investment theory, you basically want to spend the least amount to get the most amount. Okay. Um, uh, and but with, with the understanding that if you break even, I mean, most people will definitely re relate with this. If I if I break even, you know, pr pretty good. I, I'm, I have a goal good. to accomplish. I want to build a shit, mm -hmm. right? right. I, and, and I know I'm going to need a certain amount of material. I'm going to need a certain amount of nails and time, right? Mm -hmm. And if I if I if I budget it accordingly and so on, I'm fine. If I have a little bit of extra expense, and so on. So the break even mentality, I think, plays a big. Right. Our, we're not really settling. We achieved our objectives. We didn't do better than right. we possibly could. We didn't do the best, but right. good enough. Right. Right. So, so we have this cost benefit, but we also have the real world constraints. Uh, Herb mm -hmm. Simon identified, we talked about, you, know, you want to satisfy, you got to get there, you got to satisfy. Okay. Right. And that's actually why we don't want to overexpend. That's why we are kind of cognitive misers. All right. It's a term to keep us. So, so yeah, we're going to do the best we can. Cognitive we're going to satisfy. misers. Yeah. That, that, yeah that's okay. Great. Okay. We gotta have to go around that one one, one more time. <laughs> where okay. does that where does that come from? How does that fit into say I'm at a meeting. I'm at a, a professional meeting. I've given my presentation. Somebody's coming up to with me and they're asking a lot of questions. Are you mm -hmm. saying I'm going to take shortcuts? Uh, for what reason? Because I'm hungry. I got to go to the bathroom. But you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. So what it what it says is is that we don't want to spend cognitive energy. Meaning. Thinking, attending is is both takes time yes. and it's metabolically expensive. Okay, yes. um, and so we essentially want to satisfy our ability to make sense in an efficient way. So we take a lot of shortcuts. We have a letter called heuristics. Okay, yes. where yes. we basically say, oh, well, this has happened three times, so this will happen forever. Okay, we so, don't say, so, oh. So when I listen to Eric Weinstein give his explanation of his theory of everything. 
And mm -hmm. he he tends, it, I love the man, but he tends to go into analogies, for my taste, way, way too much. Right? Mm -hmm. You used an analogy of a fish, and that's kind of a mm -hmm. shortcut to some other, you know, more mechanistic right. explanation. But I love the term cognitive, what was it? Cognitive... Uh, miser. Miser. Cognitive miser. Cognitive so miser. Mm -hmm. that, that's it, incredible. Mm -hmm. Well, um, and it speaks to even a deeper principle. It goes all the way to life, which is <clears throat> um, basically it's the principle of least effort. Uh, uh, and that is, is essentially, you know, there, to, uh, to acquire and maintain your organization, okay, to do so against the forces of the second law of thermodynamics is a very, very diff difficult thing. Sure. Okay, so you're in constant battle against entropy, and to maintain a negentropic order, you have the energy that you expend relative to the dangers of entropy is always a delicate balance. So you want to spend the least amount necessary to get the effects that you want. Okay, uh, and so there's always a trade-off, uh, and what we see a lot of the times in our the way we make sense out of things, especially our automatic mind. Okay, mm -hmm. so we have that. You know, it's a, basically it makes a quick inference, it makes a quick solution, and then it doesn't sit like a scientist and say, wait a minute, there are all these graphs out there. How do you know? You know, it looks, right. at, it looks at the first good pattern it sees. If that's a good enough explanation to get what I want, boom, I'm done. I'm so, good. Uh, so real world a real world example of this that has affected a lot of, a lot of people is, mm -hmm. listen, there's risks to every medical procedure. Uh, there's public health. There's the argument for the greater good, let's say, for vaccination. But if mm -hmm. we spend too much time you know, dwelling on what is perceived as a little bit of risk, then it may overemphasize the risk for people who don't really need it. And so for those people, I might, as a public health official, decide that it's not worth our time, say, in a public health meeting to really get into the nitty gritty of all of that when I have this other agenda. So I'm going to downplay that risk just to kind of get through the day, get through the meeting, get through, you know, and, and, and so the multiple motivations come in, into play here. And, and right, public right. Health, so, I think, a public health, I think, is a public service. And I'm not sure that that's, I think people agree with me, that's not necessarily an appropriate context to make that decision on behalf of everyone. When, when we have real risks, it's like, you know, your doctor, your psychologist should not use the same thing on every patient. We're in, we have the ability to get enough information to make informed decisions per individual, per individual. But do we have the... Are we miserly in, in the, our willingness to put that investment into those people? That's right. That's yeah, why you. I that's why it. you want. That's why you want specialists who can, who we pay then to be anything but miserly and get the hell into the details and try to work it all out. Right. And in a healthy functioning society, we have a way to organize the specialists and this particular knowledge and then clean our information ecology so that we locate the intersections and networks between people that know what the hell they're doing. Unfortunately, that's not the way we set up our current system. <laughs> okay. Far from but, it. Far but but from that would it. be that would be an efficient and effective way of doing it. Um, so that's great. yeah, that's, that's, those are great. Those are great thoughts. To, to that it brings comfort to me to, to to know that those thoughts exist as even a possibility. So <laughs> here we are on the um, uh, the, the tree of knowledge. Um, let me ask you. So we've got this the, the, the cultural and the justification hypothesis. I think I think people are understanding that the justification really means um, part of understanding. Again, we're talking about psychology in particular. Part of understanding the why of why people act a certain way, or why people believe certain things, or why people hold firm to a belief once it's been disproven um, uh, sufficiently to them. Uh, is that like justification? gone wrong is it or, or, or is right. it just okay. the, the the self the lower mind self having motivations that it, it may not be fully aware of that will allow it to use to misuse justification in a manner that balances <laughs> it balances right. its current perceived needs okay it, it's all of that so i have to disentangle yeah. some of that there okay so yeah, let's just too. Let's just let's summarize. So what the what the tree of knowledge says is there's actually a thing called should be called basic psychology. OK, basic psychology, which used to be called comparative psychology and comparative psychology was the psychot was the analysis of all animal behavior and making comparisons between them. That's actually what used to be the naturalistic version of psychology that became ethology. And then it got dropped under biology. Um, 
but in the tree of knowledge, that's actually a mistake. You want to think about animal behavior as actually your descriptive definition of mind, right. okay, and then have comparative psychology be the foundation. Now, but there's a very different branch of psychology called human psychology, mm -hmm. okay? Human psychology is actually part of the social sciences. In fact, it forms the base of the social sciences, hmm. okay? And the thing that makes human psychology so different is because not only do they have this mind one and two, which means they're, they're behavioral investors and they have a, pers a, a you know, a, mammals and other things have a perspectival view of the world and they have an experience of being and they have, you know, emotions and attachments and especially in primates, and then they get all status uh, debate and stuff, but they don't actually have verbal debates. You know, you as an, if you do evolutionary biology, sociobiology, animal, you see all the cooperation and competition dynamics and all that other stuff, and they'll signal and they'll deceive and they'll do all this cool stuff, but they don't justify. Okay. okay. Um, so where, like mob mentality can come about, right? So it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a default program that we fall into to mm -hmm. fit in sociologically because the cost of us standing up against a crowd saying, you know what, this is wrong would potentially be very huge and, and the Absolutely. multiple signals kind of collapse the the mind right. into a more basal state, right? Totally, totally. In fact, there's an extension. There are four basic pieces of the unified theory. Um, there's the tree of knowledge, which you saw, behavioral investment theory, which is that life to mind joint point. Then there's a third piece called the influence matrix. The influence matrix is an extension of behavioral investment theory to the social world. Okay, and without getting into the details, but the fundamental barometer that our, we're tracking in our heart is what's called the relational value and social influence line. All right, mm -hmm. and what that means is that we're constantly tracking our place in the social matrix right. and tracking the degree of social influence that we have. All right, so if the herd starts moving in a particular direction, right, the anxiety of standing up and getting your head cut off right? He's, yeah. is built into us. It's like, no, the herd's going, go with the herd, you know, as a default, because to stand up is going to be potentially, and we have a little alarm systems that go off. And, and if you happen to be more of a dependent and conformist person, it's a, the social anxiety of ever going against a group is enormous. You know, there are the Eric Weinsteins of the world who are disagreeable people that are willing to stand up and say F you to the world. Okay, we definitely have him, I find him to be uh -huh. one of the most agreeable people I've ever listened to, specifically well, <laughs> because I went through the journey, right? So I, uh -huh, I'm, I'm, right. Writing this, I'm writing this book of mine. I've got to tell you this story. I think you'll find it amusing. Mm -hmm. I'm writing this mm -hmm. book of mine, Cures versus Profits, and I had mm. 15 or 16 chapters written. I sent it off to the publisher, and it's mm -hmm. good to go. And I said to Grace, my fiance, I said, you know, if this is a this is a lesson, you know, a, a, a book, a blueprint of how to get through this tension of of um, how do we reconcile the tension between our need for progress in medicine that is effective and saves people's lives and reduces human pain and suffering and profit. And that was a great uh, experience to go through. At the last minute, I said something's missing you know the, 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 the mm. publisher agreed and you know said could, could you write a chapter put add one more chapter i thought about it and i said i know i'll do one, i'll do one on vaccines i, I it was mm. going to be the easiest chapter in the world to save millions mm. of lives blah, blah 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 and i had to actually sit down and, and like swallow my cud when i actually mm. researched into vaccines to the extent that i did and say am i going mm -hmm. to am i am i going to show what i found and mm. I'm going to show what I, what I found. Now, some vaccines, I would say, are safer than others, and yada, yada, we don't have to go down that path. But mm -hmm. I actually mm -hmm. had to make that, that am, I in, am I in this group or am I in that group? Because I'm going to be put in this group, and this is a much larger group. I'm going to be trampled. I'm going to be lambasted. I'm never going to have a career in academia again. I'm like, what am I walking away from? What am I walking towards? And all of that was, a, I was super conscious of that tension and that anxiety. Yeah. And I'm glad I made the choice that I made. I really am. It's, mm -hmm. it's been an, an enlightened. It, it's a more enlightened path for me. But anyway, yeah, um, yeah. So go ahead. So I, yeah, I can totally echo with that. In fact, I've been moving. You know, I'm a, I did go the full professor route and 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 have established myself. But I'm also, as I'll tell everybody, you know, I love the blue church notion that Jordan Hall advocates for, and, and you know, and would come up in Eric Weinstein's notions and things like that. And his, yeah. you know, there's a there's an idea complex here, 
uh, that the that institutionalized justification systems that are built around investment and influence structures that have an enormous amount of inertia in them, even that's if right. there are a lot of bullshit in them. Okay, exactly so that's right. uh, that's but, exactly. But Eric, Eric is where he needs to be right now. I'm where I need to be right now, because without without the alternatives, without the alternatives of what can come outside of you know the catacombs. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. The catacombs, Absolutely. not the ivory tower. There's no ivory tower for real, <laughs> right? It's a ca you're down in the dark, dank cellar of literal right. darkness because that's, right. that's that's what's going to pay your bills next month. And right. that's what's going to get you to the next advance in your career. And I'm not putting anybody down. That's just the way it's structured. Right. What, what I'd like to do well, is... Ac like actually, to... Uh, actually, a guy by the name of Oliver Reiser in 1958 OK, uh, a philosopher who's way out here and developed a temple of knowledge to integrate human uh, knowledge um, yeah. in 1958 opens the book that says we have to get ourselves out of the dark and meaningless catacombs of learning that characterize the academy. <laughs> that is exactly right. And that, so and, that, is, and, that, and that feeds into this, this program that I'm going to talk about in, in our second hour. But we'll come back to that. So I want to finish off on your tree of knowledge here. Uh, have, right. we, have we have we missed any parts here? So we start with the Big Bang. You've got an evolutionary component. We came yep, we, got we came from ancestors that have things. We have physiological factors, emergent properties from our brain, uh, uh, that, that a nervous system, central nervous system, and so on. We have the evolutionary synthesis uh, and from biology, other biological effects. Oh, there's one thing I wanted to add here. When you mm -hmm. brought in this cultural uh, aspect. In the social sciences it is specifically framed around the question of okay you've got the mind and then you've got the mind interacting with this environment and one of the things that i think if we bring psychology and psychiatry together where they should overlap in my view is that we need to be super super conscious uh, in psychology i say we i'm not a psychologist but we need to be super super conscious in, in framing out a psychology in which the unknown undetected influences of environment specifically the toxins the, the sure. right metals fluoride uh, glyphosate these effects that on the central nervous system this this low ambient toxic load of thousands and thousands from the that we have the chemistry uh industry to thank where they yep. create a they create a corporate product that maximizes profit they find it's creating a lot of waste what am I going to do with the waste? I'm going to put it in the food. I'm going to put it in agriculture. I'm going to put, you know, make a dye out of it. Or whatever, right? They actually try to commercialize their waste to maximize their profits. It ends up dumping a lot of things that we didn't evolve with. We, and so they're toxic sure. to us. And that, uh, I, I think um, uh, practicing psychologists and psychiatrists would, would, do, would, would be great if they started doing tox screens on people. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. We'll see what's yep. in their CNS and see what's sure. in their plasma. See what's see what they That's can right. pull out of the blood with a little chelation. Uh, mm -hmm. so, sorry, their tissue with a little chelation because people are fighting for their lives with chronic microglial activation. Their their glutamate in their brain is yep. way way over, uh, too way too much glutamate. They can't get rid of it. It's not spilling over into the into the blood like it should. Mm -hmm. And 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 so these these other things there's 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 a place here I think for the um, the environment influencing the brain in a way that the brain's not even aware of. I didn't choose to oh. drink in this glass of water, you know, the perchlorate that the EPA now will not stop regulating. I didn't choose that. I'm not aware of that. A lot of people don't understand what they're eating and drinking, and so that's a big part of the unknown effects. On the, and, it, and it relates to the biological, uh, uh, that's the, right. the, the biology end of it. So up here, that's right. talking here, and then the biology. Mm -hmm. So go ahead. Right. Well, right. So we are just, we are these nested systems, okay, of complex adaptation. So everything that is psychological is nested in the physiological, right. okay? And so the quality of that physiology um, is key and you're right we have the modern technological world that we have built and what it has turned the environment into and what we ingest and what that means for our neurochemical constitution is a is an enormous question okay uh, and and absolutely requires uh, intersection between you know environmental ecology uh, neurobiology psychology all of that the other thing that i want to say if we get into culture now when you get a culture in the two so that's that's the environmental biophysiological 
element. The mm-hmm. culture refers to the ecology of belief value ideologies, okay? Mm-hmm. The, the systems of justification that legitimize and coordinate our actions, all right? So, so for me, you talk about psychiatry, and yes, I have a beef with psychiatry. I have a beef with everybody, basically, but I have a beef with psychiatry. Um, you know, my beef with psychology is nobody knows what the F psychology is. My beef with psychiatry is they totally oversell what I call the disease pill model, yeah. okay, of yeah. mental health, especially, it's, you know, of, for neurotic conditions. I mean, right now, you know, uh, you know, you're just defined as having an anxiety disorder if you meet these criteria. So there's a total descriptive taxonomy tautology. Well, how do you know you have it? Well, you meet these criteria. Now we have this, we show you a picture of a brain and a neuron, and then you're like, well, gosh, I must have a chemical imbalance in my anxiety system. If I take this pill, I feel a little better. And now you've cured. Yeah, yeah now, now you're cured. When in fact, actually, if we are all going collectively crazy, okay, uh, Martin Luther King, in his address to the American Psychological Association, I think it was 1968, um, said, you psychologists have given us a great word, maladjusted. And he then says, there are some things to which we should be maladjusted to. Okay. Uh, so, you know, all of a sudden you're like, well, wait a minute, what are you saying? Well, maybe if you've been oppressed in a particular way and getting brutalized, you should be miserable and bitter. Okay, yeah. and what, it isn't that's necessarily what, that's what those mental states are for. Yeah, that's exactly what that's they're a for. healthy they normal reaction to be pissed off. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. I mean, I I argue that depression, getting back to behavioral investment theory, is the is the biophysiological neuropsychological system of shutdown. The system shutting down because its mm-hmm. pathways of investment have been constrained and restricted, and then you get a hopeless, helpless, shut down attitude, which may make perfect sense. If you're like on the train to Auschwitz or something horrible, right? right. So right. the idea that depression is always a disease, okay, is a, is a gross misunderstanding. And a shutdown response may make perfect sense if you're an abused wife or been thrown in prison, you know, unjustifiably or any well, other number of possible issues. Most so, of the life-changing motivations that I've had personally have come out of a miserable, <laughs> a miserable mental state. And I use the word mental in the, just addressing that it's, I know it's my brain, a miserable state, uh, you know, uh, of awareness or whatever, where, where I was either angry or pissed off uh, or scared, or these are normal things, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely. The, 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 the depression hasn't played a, a significant role that I'm aware of, uh, and clinically that's been ruled out for, but, but it's, a, it's a great motivator. You're, you're, in a, you're in an imbalanced position. And if you can take sure. a pill to make you feel numb to the imbalance, it's gonna, you're going to lose motivation for creativity. You're going to lose motivation for problem solving. You're going to feel like it's not your responsibility. I can just take this pill, and, I, and okay, it goes away a while. You're just Absolutely. by buying some time, and that's mm-hmm. all. And you may right. be doing damage with side effects. Well, right. There are definitely dangerous side effects. Uh, You know, listen, it's a very complicated thing. Absolutely. I believe dark nights of soul kinds of dynamics lead to emotional depth. They lead to perspective taking. They lead to appreciation for uh, with the happier sides of life. They add richness and color. Um, If you could just eliminate all negative emotion, it'd be a disaster. Just like eliminating pain. Uh, You know, it's basically it's the behavioral analog, uh, socio behavioral analog which basically is like, this is going well, this is not going well, and, and it is what gives richness to existence. Uh, that's a great and analogy. So we have, People that can't feel pain end up destroying their bodies. That's, that's right. A great analogy. So thank mm-hmm. you for that. Absolutely. So, so that's the behavioral investment. Then we have the, uh, the extension of that's the influence matrix. That's our social relations. It deals with attachment, competition, cooperation, our desire for social influence, all part of our primate existence. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, which, by the way, I would say that that's our mental existence and actually doesn't reduce to the brain. Um, we can talk about that, but it's a mental dimension of existence that's operative. And then you have the narrator. And, and, and you say that because it can be changed. It's not. It, it, well, a person can change mm-hmm. their mental state. Sure. Right. Uh, for a, well, for a whole host of reasons, I, I will... Uh, there's actually... There's a superordinate plane, complex adaptive plane of mentation. That's really the way to think about it. That is yeah. certainly... It's superordinate on the neurophysiology, and of course the neurophysiology is required to mediate it, but you cannot talk about love at the level of brain. 
You just can't. You can talk about it in terms of at the level of my dog. My dog might love me, and we can talk about that. We can get a whole brain activity in terms of phenomenology and the pattern of behavioral investment. I don't, want to, anyway. I don't want to be too reductionist, but I'll challenge you to that a little mm -hmm. bit. If you have a, mm -hmm. a mutation in your oxytocin receptor, mm -hmm. right, you can get down to the cellular physiology. You might have a hard time making pair bonding, let's say, or you know, oh, you have right. too little Listen. oxytocin produced, right? And so mm -hmm. it's possible to, it, you can't disconnect it, it's there. What you're saying is that it's No, false. right. So I'm saying that's nested holarchies, they're actually technically called. Holarchy. So absolutely. You got uh -huh, a great terminology, how... man. Where have you been all my life? <laughs> holarchies. That's beautiful. A holarchy, yeah. Like uh, actually, yeah. Uh, it goes back to Kessler and, and was popularized by a guy by the name of Ken Wilbur, who's uh, famous for integral theory, uh, right. which is, pops up in various things. But anyway, it's the part whole nested relationship of, of cause. And so any whole is going to be dependent upon the parts. We've been guilty, uh, as scientists, uh, a number of scientists at least, have been guilty with their pursuit of reductive causes that give rise to reductive language causation in a way that's actually problematic. So that's, that's it. We're on the same agreement. And, and Absolutely. Then, and then an oversimplified medical practice. And then oversimplified policies, exactly. Oversimplified policies. Oh, one more to generalizations. So, yeah, sure. Right, right. So, so for me, and in fact, actually, what the tree of knowledge tries to update are descriptive metaphysics, okay, uh, which basically says a descriptive metaphysics is um, not pure metaphysics, like, oh, is there a god? But it's like, what are the concepts and categories we use? What's the language game that we're playing? Um, and this provides a way to m give a much greater descriptive metaphysics that's grounded in a naturalistic science, okay? Um, so, for example, I have a, one of my uh, nephews after his first year, you know, came to me and he was like, well, what did you learn in college? And he, and he learned, he's like, well, I learned a, just a bunch of chemicals, okay? So he, he took a neuroscience class and a reductive philosophy class, and it's like, no, you know, <laughs> don't learn that. You're not just a bunch of chemicals. You're, you're a, you exist on the culture, person, plane of existence. Right. You and I are engaged in a conversation that's not reducible to brains. It is mediated by brain activity, but that's not the same thing. And you, your life has meaning at this cultural level, okay? And so that's just, I use that as a little microcosm to say, if we're dangerous and careless with our physical reduction of this language, we act as though the only thing that's real is that first dimension of complexity, right. okay? And exactly. that's actually not clearly the case. Um, the patterns of behavioral activity are, uh, look at this conversation. I mean, it's a pattern of behavioral activity that's emergent, that's mediated by novel information processing communication systems, and exists on its own terms in relationship to that. Um, so, so anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm keen on us uh, understanding how to get the dialectic between reduction and emergence correct. And, and I don't know that, I don't think we've done that yet. Uh, and you combine that with a problem of psychology, which was that we don't know how to talk about mind. Um, and that's where a lot of our language systems get a lot of problem. And actually, quite frankly, to get to our modern day context, we're experiencing a meaning crisis. Uh, I think, writ large. We don't know how to make sense out of the world. We don't know who to rely on. We don't know where our experts are. And that's, you know, one of the things the Tree of Knowledge fundamentally about. You talk about unbreaking science. It's like, well, it's about trying to get a scientific, naturalistic worldview that's actually up to the task of giving us a appropriate descriptive metaphysics for the 21st century. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. We're going to get into that in a big way in a little bit here. We're going to go topic by topic. So, um, when when you have, but, but first I'd like to address whether or not, well, how, how, how would your tree of life received, you know, by your peers early in your career when it first came out and how has it evolved um, in, in, uh, in a meaningful way for other people in psychology? What, what, what have there been reactions been? Tell me about conferences, conversations, papers published, discussions, you know? Yeah. Well, that's, that's been a very interesting thing. So uh, at first, uh, you know, when I first had actually a tree of knowledge, I drew it out in 30 seconds. So it's, a, it's an interesting thing about its history. I mean, not in its full form by any stretch, but the sketch of it. Yeah. Um, and, and I drew that out just before Edward O. Wilson's Consilience came out. Right. Okay? Consilience, the unity of knowledge. And there's a lot of overlap. You know, uh, although he's a, he's a, he doesn't have the mind problem solved by any stretch like I did. Well, but I can a, connect. His, no, his is a generic one that manifests within 
within biology and, and, and specifically evolutionary biology and ecology. Right, but, but, yeah, but that's true. Consilience for the listener, consilience is making an assessment on what reality is most like based on the balance of the most data that, yep. right, that is that the most, not just the most reliable, the, the most data. And so it's a form, it's related to consensus in a manner where, you know, do, does, does evidence tend to agree? Um, mm -hmm. and, and having been at the core of the debate of phylogenetic an analytic methods, where the Cladis used to bite people at meetings, what, what, what <laughs> hardcore Cladis actually bit somebody in the back, at, you know, for using <laughs> maximum likelihood, and having a finger poked in my chest for not using a maximum likelihood, people are, you know, maladapted to holding, holding on to these ridiculous paradigms about how to make a particular scientific inference because they think it will further their career more so right. than right anything else because NSF funding was limited but you know Wilson being the grandfatherly type figure that he was you know he's like it's okay if you don't know math that well you have other skills that you can right and I'm like okay that's fine um I, I'd like to I'd like to use math and things that I do in modeling but um yep. his consilience said you know if you want to understand how you know insect let's say social networks in the social social net, social insects actually uh, behave and, and why they behave and so on. You can't just look at the behavior itself. You have to look at the environment. You have to look at you know Absolutely. logical reasons and, and, and bring forward the, the 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 bulk of the evidence to weigh to bear and don't just emphasize one particular aspect of it. Yep. Uh, and, and, and of that, reductionism is one form of just looking at one type of data or one type of data. Yep. So, yeah. so you, you agree, certainly, and have mm -hmm. talked about I, it in your writings about consilience being playing an influence right. on... Uh, Absolutely. It, yeah. was a, it, was, it was so... Right. So this is... I, basically, I loved the book in general, um, but it was by a sociobiologist who did not understand the problem of psychology, basically. Right. Right. Okay. So that's, that's the... And he just did not really know how to make the jump uh, from animal sociobiology into the human mind and then into the socio-cultural dimensions of existence, which is exactly what I was working on. I okay? remember thinking at the time that he was threading a needle to say, since sociobiology has a, kind of a dark past in some yeah. ways, he was trying to thread, right. thread a needle to, totally. to, to try to get sociobiology through this safely without yes. inspiring the next you know, Hitler. <laughs> Well, right. Well, at first, in 19, uh, when he first published it in 1975, uh, Sociobiology, actually, he wasn't trying to thread the needle at that juncture. No, okay, right, right. When he was first doing it, he was like, it's in your face, and we're going to cannibalize the social sciences and the humanities. And then the Gould and all the other environmentalists and the feminists of the 1970s went ballistic, and they basically told him that this is the path to social Darwinism and right. Nazism. And of course, right. that's not who Wilson was, but he then went off and did biophilia and said, no, I'm actually about loving life, right. and then came back and does consilience, where he's trying to then say, I have a vision of a naturalistic vision that stretches the whole panoply from you know physics and the Big Bang into my view of biology, into mind, and then into culture and the social sciences and humanities, ultimately. Yeah. And, and I was like, yeah, you are working on the outline of consilience, but I can come to you and tell you, because we can't solve the problem of psychology, your chapter on the mind, adequate as it is, basically sucks in relationship to where I'm sitting, okay? Mm -hmm. And the jump that you make from mind to culture is completely inadequate. You don't have the justification joint point, okay? Which is what I built. And then I built the tree of knowledge off of that. So I wrote him uh, and was like, hey, you know, and then wrote uh, Dan Dennett and, and all of the big thinkers of the day and the yeah. evolutionary psychologists. So this in terms of getting the history of like how are the ideas received, my hope was to hook into these kinds of individuals who had a lot of clout and status. I reached out to them. I connected to them, tried to for years, um, only with occasional pat on the head and move on. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, by the way, while I'm working with Aaron T. Beck, who is the father of cognitive therapy at the University of Pennsylvania. And I thought he might be interested, but then it turned out he wasn't. And so eventually I then had to say, well, wait, wait a minute. Um, okay, this isn't going to happen through somebody sort of knighting me and saying, bringing me to Harvard to give a guest lecture through E.O. Wilson. That isn't going to happen. And then I was like, well, I'll go straight through the traditional academic channels. I was then 
I, I worked very hard with Beck. I did a very good job with him at, during the day. I built this theory at night. I saw a way to um, juxtapose it in the first major publication, which was in 2003, published it in Review of General Psychology, um, and got a very interesting replies, um, some of which, you know, definitely people were interested. Uh, and indeed, it ended up into two special issues in the Journal of Clinical Psychology in 2004 and five. So it stirred up definitely some. Uh, but what I then learned was there was no way to get traction on the idea in the institution. And what I mean by that is it was a really big idea, obviously. Look at all the different places we taught. Right. So everyone has different reactions to it. So that's just one nature of the idea. And the other thing is that I realized the blue church problem, which is the institutional inertia of the system has already committed to certain kinds of ideas and ideologies, and people are already full professor in those ideas. Um, and, the, and I realized that actually psychology, even though I'm a deep scientist at heart, psychology overcommits to empiricism in a particular way as it tries to compensate for its inability to get its terms right. So it then says, well, we'll measure everything, and then we'll test everything to the best of our ability. But if your terms aren't right anyway, you get garbage in, garbage out. Okay, but but they were committed to empiricism, not meta theory. And so the combination of all of these kinds of things allowed me. Certainly, I continue to produce um, academic papers and things, but there was no way to get institutional traction. So that the system would actually make a substantive difference. And ultimately, I found my way. It's a longer story. We don't get into it. Found my way sort of on the now on the outside of academia, even as a you know somebody with an established record, hanging out with and tracking you know Eric Weinstein and the Rebel Wisdom crowd and intellectual dark web stuff and all of that. So so that's so, you know. so there's there's a there's a particular volume that, that that I happened upon in my research for you uh, of the journal Journal of Clinical Psychology, I think, um, mm -hmm. where you had some people that wrote about you, which is fantastic, wrote about the tree of life. They analyzed it. They said their tree of knowledge. Yep. Tree of knowledge. Sorry. Um, uh, and, and, and they weighed in. Uh, what, what, mm -hmm. Do you have any recollection, you know, have any stories to tell, say, of, of feedback from uh, detailed stories? Like I want the nitty gritty. What did they think about it? What, what how did it help them? What, 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 uh, what, sure. what I talk about, I'm, I'm about to launch something which I'll get into in a little bit, but I'm about to launch something called transitional science. I want to popularize the idea of transitional science. So in medicine, mm. it's really clear that if you do basic research, you go from bench to bedside and back, it's translational. Mm. But yep. transitional science, uh, I think we need to map out a path by which sciences can mature in, in a way that captures the, the fundamentals of the knowledge and so on, but leads to um, um, new understandings, new profoundly, um, profoundly new understandings of ourselves and the universe around us. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's a, it's a daunting task. But if we put like you, 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 you we need the language to say what are the transitional uh, impacts? Yep. How has it brought about change in psychology? And what do these guys have and our ladies have to say about it? Yeah. So. Um... I was very fortunate so that what Larry Butler uh, it was the editor of the Journal of Clinical uh, Psychology, the journal. Uh, and, you know, I happened to have a dinner with him and we talked and he learned he had heard of my theory and was interested. He said he was a little daunted by it, but I explained it to him and he's like, oh, OK, that actually makes sense. Um, and I'll give you an opportunity to, you know, put together a special issue. So then I was like, great, you know, and I was a young, I had just gotten hired at James Madison University. Um, and I reached out to people uh, and, and I got a good solid response and some major hitters, uh, you know, uh, Keith Stanovich is a major figure in the field. Um, uh, uh, Steve Hayes is a major figure in the field. He came up with acceptance and commitment therapy, um, Dave Geary. Um, I connected with a wide variety of different individuals and was actually able to produce two special issues. The first has like 14 different commentaries on it. Mm -hmm. um, about four of them are pretty negative. You know, it's like, do we need this? And this system's too complicated. And no, we, this is the wrong direction. Uh, about four of them are really, hey, this has got a lot of potential. Here are some concerns. And about four of them are very positive and say, hey, this is a good way to go. Uh, and then the second issue, I had had developed some real close colleagues and friends. Uh, sure. Steve Quackenbush to this day uh, until, uh, you know, is a good friend of mine. Uh, Lee Schaefer, unfortunately, he passed away. Uh, he was a social psychologist and 
an anthropologist who immediately saw the justification hypothesis as a missing piece. Um, so he came on and was an ally for it. Uh, Craig Shealy had hired me, and he did work in beliefs and values. So I had a cluster of close friends, and Dave Geary is an evolutionary biologist, who, a psychologist, uh, who interested in gender and cognition and saw the behavioral investment theory provided him a frame. So we were able to really cobble together this good system. Um, and I was able to then have two conferences, Visions of Integration, where I brought people together of about 50, and we had this exchange. So I, I was able, by 2007, I really thought the system was going to launch and make yeah. a big difference. Uh, and then and, that's and so when it... that, what was your expectation of the best possible outcome where the theory... So the best took a mm -hmm. manifestation and change in psychology practice. Let's talk about right. that. Right. What would so, that look like to you? So basically what it would look, what it should, it, what I was hoping it would look like is, oh yes, psychology really does have a problem, a uh, fragmented problem, what I call the problem of psychology. We need a- Fragmentation of knowledge, right? The, the fragmentation, special, right. Specialization, right. There's mm -hmm. specialization without a core consensus about what mind and behavior means, right. okay? Right. So, which actually Lev Vygotsky, I mean, this has been known by psychologists until 1920, Lev Vygotsky identified this, all right? So, I thought that if psychologists agree that science is about both logic and evidence to create coherence, i.e. consilience, and we were crystal clear that the, we had a serious problem of coherence, right. and here is a novel proposal for coherence that seems to pull lots of threads together, people would then bring that home and say to themselves, hey, we really need to study this, see how this language system holds up, and put it to the test and see if we can translate it into our own departments and, and our own clinical work and our own experimental work and begin the process of saying like, yes, can we apply this language system in an efficient and effective way? That's what I thought would have happened in 2007. I actually really thought I was about ready to be launched into a system of transformation uh, and that's what then didn't happen. Uh, after everyone sort of came together, these two special uh, conferences that I got some money for, everybody had all their different opinions about it, okay? Some people liked the justification but hated behavioral investment theory. Other people, the reverse. And very few people who were established were really interested in entering into it and then really trying to cultivate it. Because really, if you were established almost by definition, it would say, you know, actually you're built on kind of some foundational sand issues that you need to kind of redo. And that okay. takes a set of balls to actually, you know, go back to the, right, go back to the beginning. and Go shake, back to the, right, so it should then shake the tree of life. And shake the tree, have, nobody, yeah, nobody, people don't want that. to do that. They can't. Yeah. They're trained. You, you know. Uh, uh, look, I mean, you want to take you know, the, the, the You want to. You want to give the tree of life a little bit of a trim here. You want to add a little leaf right. there. You would progress incrementally, and I've often wondered what would happen to every single scientific domain if we went back to the beginning of its foundations and shake the tree of knowledge, and right. say how would things fall out if the discovery right. process had a chance to redo itself. If certain experiments were conducted at this time instead of that time because it's entry order sensitive, science is entry order sensitive. It's so pathetic that we, what we hold up as our best way of knowing things about them, ourselves, you know, our world and the universe around us is entry order sensitive. It depends on who comes first. Because on with the order of experiments, we could be fooled on blind alleys and blind paths, or we could be on the cusp of a great discovery, and it, and it waits for 50 years until somebody goes wait a minute, you know, this, this looks funny. This isn't fitting. So hundred percent. Yep. yep. Right, that, so, and so, 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 so go, ahead. go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, I just said, so, so the momentum then stalled basically is the short yeah. answer. And, and, and it didn't catch traction. And then people just then, then it was around long enough. So, Oh, that's Henricus unified theory. You know, it's like, well, we heard of that and whatever. It's super complicated. I don't know, blah, 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 but I'm doing my thing. And that's essentially, so that was 2009. Um, I then shifted basically my focus uh, from promoting the unified theory of psychology to be like, well, the, I want to go back to my original problem, build a unified approach to psychotherapy and show that we sure. can integrate the fields of psychotherapy to create a unified approach. I did that from 2011. I published the book, did that from 2011 to 2016, mm -hmm. um, was in fields of integrative psychotherapy, actually encountered pretty much the same basic kind of problem dynamic that I couldn't, uh, although a little bit more receptivity, but still changing the institutional inertia was unbelievably difficult. Um, 
And in 2016, I started going off on a slightly different path that gets me to where I am today, which is sort of, in some ways, outside the academy uh, as part of concerned about the blue church inertia and thinking about a real radical transformation, uh, starting knowledge almost over as the digital world emerges yeah. and basically connecting with people that have been booted out of the institutional inertia. Uh, and maybe we can reestablish a different kind of connection with a different kind of lens of understanding. Oh, I love it. I love it, which is a great segue into, I wasn't going to do it yet, but the auto, the autognosis program that we have at IPAC is, a, is mm. a, a, an AI program that is being built. I have a developer that's working mm -hmm, with me. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, imagine taking any domain of knowledge, any domain of scientific inference, or any epistemological uh, or epistemic uh, uh, sphere of inquiry. It mm -hmm. doesn't. Ha it could be history. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. and, yep. and and what there's text recognition. There's uh, language. There, there's uh, there are algorithms. There are core algorithms. Mm -hmm. There are deep learning algorithms. And then yep. we're, we're marrying them with, you know, semantic and contextual understanding algorithms, with a specific mm -hmm. goal. And of uh, there's a couple of phases. In phase one. Yep. Imagine downloading all of the abstracts, let's say, since it's your field uh, or something. Let's just keep it constrained to evolutionary psychology. Let's just go to. Yep. And what we want sure. to do is we want to train this algorithm. We'll have a version of the algorithm that's trained uh, the, on, on evolutionary psychology as it exists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, it is curated by practitioners of that science and, and people that, mm -hmm. that work in that science because by it asking questions it poses mm. questions and it's really interesting mm -hmm. that our conversation said it's really you know inexpensive to ask questions but mm -hmm. basically it gets graded on its understanding of certain things by asking nice. questions about whether the question makes sense is this a sensible yep. question and then what it what we'll do is we'll actually start it out by training it on the fundamentals, the basics, right? So yep. English, English language, biology, chemistry, math. Uh, we'll try to train it, right? Brilliant. And, and, yeah, absolutely. And, and then once we have it trained up in evolutionary psychology and evolutionary biology, uh, any domain of influence, then we start bringing these to fairly knowledge databases. We make a version of it that starts bringing it together. Yep. And and so then it starts asking questions and posing hypotheses by by synthesizing the knowledge that yep. the, as it's represented. Now, we don't understand how this algorithm is going to represent it. We won't be able to go in there and say this particular neural network, right? Mm -hmm. It's a tri triple layer neural network sure. contains sure. this or that information. We it's can't the nature of machine learning. We, yeah, we can't decode it, right? And so we're not trying to emulate human intelligence by any means. We're also not trying to have it tell us anything. We're trying to, other than where are the most important unknowns? Mm. What, what, right? And, and so if you're yep. trying to understand right. anything, if we develop this, when we develop this autognosis program, I think this could be a way that reflects and mirrors the integration that went on in your mind. Exactly. Across all domains of mm -hmm. epistemic inquiry to the point where we have completely changed the way that science is conducted. Hundred percent. Yep. I, I don't think that the that, that the old, the old gray-haired people in a, that have the sphere of influence that they have should keep their thumb on what we can ask, the questions that we can ask, <laughs> the questions that we can't ask anymore. I don't think we should have to wait, as the famous expression goes, for the right people to die. Right. right in 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 a, in, in, in a, right. we don't have that long <laughs> we don't have that long plus if you then put the clock forward right and we have this thing asking questions anybody could use it it'll be open access right. what what are the most pressing questions and and with the trade-off of okay if we knew this about autism then we might know this about something else um that then the, the trade-off then then becomes that we're investing wisely in the right kinds of questions to forward and advance knowledge for the sake of knowing and that knowledge for the sake of knowingness of science why we all got excited as kids knowledge for the sake of knowing has so many layers of control over the top of it that there are people acting in ways that are absolutely insane and i agree with eric weinstein on this that fields of inference can go insane knowing full well that what they're teaching is incorrect but doing it because they think it's the thing that they have to do 
knowing full well, publishing things that are not correct, acting as though it's correct, and, and that that level, that level of discord, I, my brain can't handle it. I, 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 I ha, I'm a realist in, in that manner. So this autonosis program it does nothing other than take textual input, crunches it into new questions, and, and then when we bring different spheres of influence and different spheres of inquiry together, that's when the synthesis really happens. That's when the, that's when the program starts to find discordant pieces of information and it comes yeah. up with questions and that level of discordance is actually represented mathematically so um yep. it, it'll be it'll be fun to see what happens with uh with psychology what yeah. you know you have your opinion which is expansive be it even as expansive as it is i'm sure there's questions that that are worth asking that that haven't been thought about in psychology that have the, the oh, beauty yeah. of it is it has no agenda Right, it has no agenda. Science is wide open ended. So let's say we run science this way for two for twenty years, where right we have this massive amount of laterally published information. Not enough people uh, pay attention to what other people are publishing in domains of their own interests, let alone domains of neighboring, uh, you know, sphere uh, of inquiry. Um, what would happen in twenty years? What would science look like? And yeah. You know, the re this is key to, to my personality uh, in my history. I've had every job that I've had in academia, my director at one point or another told me that I needed to slow down, right? I, the person in my supervisor told me I needed to slow down because if I finished everything too quickly, there'd be nothing left to do, that kind of thing, right? I've got to stretch this out. And I, I'm like, well, yeah, but I'm just hungry for knowledge and I want to know and I want to advance. And that's relates to our earlier conversation about accessing knowledge, but then knowing how to use it. And so yeah. this other leg of that I'm building is this transitional science. So, okay, so we know this particular thing in ecology. How do we transition that to the betterment of the planet, the betterment of humanity? You right, that's that in 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 medicine at least they come up with translational. How do we get drugs to market? Right. All right. Right. So that they had a huge incentive to do that. Where's the, the equivalent transitional science uh, for ecology, for psychology, for evolutionary yep. biology? What does it What does it matter? Well, what's the point? And it's right. so ingrained in me and so natural to me to not have faith in science, as mm -hmm. as just because if somebody calls it science. It's so ingrained right. in me that um, I think we need to take a look at this as a um, the next step after Thomas Kuhn. In, in the philosophy of science, because the best philosophers that I know have all become Stoics. Mm. They, they, they just have to accept things as uh, the way that they are. They, they, you know, this is there's nothing more to do, kind of thing. But I think that <laughs> we're not using the technology that we have in a way that um, in a way that would I think set things on fire. What does chaos yeah. theory have to do with seizures, for instance? Yeah. Right. We we we've yeah. got to bring all that together and and. Yeah have epiphany after epiphany after epiphany. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, this is an IPAC project to the, the Institute for Pure and Applied Knowledge. If those if anybody wants to you know, help support it, I'm certainly almost ready to hang the shingle for, for fundraising. We have the, um, we have the blueprints of, of the architecture of the software built hmm. to date. You, so. you, you should be in touch with it. Do you know Corey David Barker by any chance? No. You just check out, um, do a YouTube video search on his architectonic uh, simulacra, which is an idea basically, the architectonic is a term from Kant, um, but it basically is about, it's a conceptual system for how to tie together all epistemological questions. Mm -hmm. uh, that would then, that actually is grounded in an algorithmic complexity that is translatable to math and AI. So yeah, it sounds it sounds quite related. That would be, I'd be fascinated to look that up. So yeah, no, I think that I think what you're suggesting is exactly what's going to happen: is that we're overloaded in scientific data, uh, but we don't have various systems to to find consilience. And I think there's going to be big data and strong AI versions that will help us do that. And I think there's going to be a resurgence uh, in synthetic philosophy and meta, uh, you know, what I call my system now a unified meta psychology. Um, which basically is like, yeah, psych uh, psych the philosophers were just, they had cool models for synthetic philosophy and then they gave up on the project, um, that they gave up on the project too early. 
and we yoke this together, these kinds of, you know, an empirical data scan, data crawl, searching, machine learning, get the right questions, and an architecture of understanding, you know, at the macro theory level, and that's a powerful combo. Yeah, I think that's where we're going for sure. And the, the nice thing is that it's, it's, it's well outside of the catacombs. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a, right. It's, a, it's a, the whole point of actually the, the integration of human knowledge, which actually, which in the prescient uh, view of Oliver Reiser, he said we had to work because what we were leaning towards, if we did it right, was what he called the world sensorium, okay, mm -hmm. which was a transition. This was, by the way, before Internet and everything, uh, but it was a fundamental transition. Um, and this allows us actually to maybe make some transitions about where we are, where we're going, how the unified theory works. So if you recall the unified theory in its four different dimensions, okay, you have matter at the bottom, right? And then you have these other emergent planes of existence or dimensions of behavioral complexity. And then you ask, well, what is this? Why are these in just one cone? Why are these different four cones? And what does it give rise to a different complex adaptive plane of existence? And the fundamental answer is, is that there are self-organizing systems that are pulled together by both information processing systems. So for example, DNA, RNA, building proteins to create self-organized structures, and then communication between systems like cell-cell communication. Okay, and that, it's that process of semantic information processing to make information prediction and to build networks of information processing systems and communication between entities that gives rise to that living plane, which makes biology radically different than physics, okay? Well, then you get neurons connecting uh, cells together to coordinate whole animals, which then communicate. And then you get mind, okay? That third dimension of complexity. So again, you got an information processing system and a communication system. Well, then you get talking, or an open semantic syntactical system of talking, which allows us to recursively think amongst ourselves via language and communicate. You get the culture person plane. Okay? So we see in a pattern here, information processing, network together, communication systems, and centralized control that can coordinate. Well, then you look at the 20th century and you're like, well, did that start to happen in a different way? You know? Bingo. Yeah, absolutely. It, it reminds me. It reminds me of my theory of everything, which is it boils down to one statement, uh, which is that which persists is, exists. And, mm. um, it's a it's a fractal it's a uh, <laughs> fractal representation mm -hmm. of reality that you know um, it, it related to the concept of not putting all of your eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. We find mm -hmm. stability in systems that swap inter components of themselves, smaller parts. So in sexual reproduction, for instance, the swapping of chromosome parts or the recombination mm -hmm. in planetary mm -hmm. systems, you know, they, 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 they share bits and pieces of each other, including matter and energy uh, mm -hmm. in, in, just, in just the right way where they, they persist long enough for us to catch them existing. And right. So a lot of our understanding of reality is biased towards this particular frame the, the, the systems that tend to persist and uh, all, all the way down to the subatomic particles so right, um, right. in the well, psychological that's realm it's going to be fascinating to wonder you know since the world is kind of coming together with all cultures intermingling right mm -hmm. this is an experiment in this about what parts of which cultures are are going to persist and what parts of co which cultures are not going to persist and in, the, right. in an era in which the, the next 15 seconds is more important to you than the last 15 years, right, where we have an economy of uh, a spectacle and an economy of attention, where we pay attention yes. to the people that have the most interesting things to say on YouTube and Facebooks and Twitters and so on. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see this homogenization process uh, take hold from a scientific perspective, thinking in terms of, you know, millions and millions of years of human evolution, but what are we going to be left with? And, who's con yep. and, 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 and who is the profit motive going to impose itself as, a, as an overly emphasized um, place, uh, you know, holder for a, a symbolic representation of good? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and we need to work against that entropy of the decay of, of, of humanity yep. uh, in, in, in every way, shape, and form. And that relates us to the 
to the modern topics that we're talking about for the for the next half hour or so, which is what have you found in your reflections on current events, including the pandemic, societal's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as Black Lives Matters and anything else that's going on in the world you, you care to, what, what, what value, what's the transitional value of the tree of knowledge uh, uh, in your view? Where should people mm-hmm. focus? What can they use? What can they leverage? How can we launch off of this towards uh, you know, good resolutions in your view? Oh, I'll let you take yep. it over. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so six uh, weeks to six months, I don't remember exactly. I'd have to, you know, uh, after I built the tree of knowledge, um, the information processing communication dynamic of life, mind, and culture was salient in my head. And I then made the connection uh, that we had built artificial computers, we we're building an internet, and we are starting to see centralized control systems and very novel ways of communicating. Okay, so I knew what, uh, or based on my map of the tree of knowledge, I thought then that the 21st century would be an unbelievably dramatic century in the sense that what we would see in the emergence of the next hundred years is the emergence of a novel plane, complex adaptive plane of existence, uh, the digital dimension, which would in some ways be metacultural. We would see new kinds of behaviors as human information processing got yoked up with artificial information processing, yoked at a global scale of what uh, Riser called the world sensorium, okay? So, so it dawned on me that we were actually in the cosmic coordinates of, the, of our human story. We were actually in the midst of a transition with the emergence now of these independent but also interfacing information systems and communication systems. It was like when we started talking you know, that's the kind of dramatic change that the, that the tree of knowledge pointed to and portended for the 21st century. Is that, you know, we were sort of like at the animal mind level, we were like at the level of jellyfish, okay? So we had these distributed neural nets, and on the horizon was the Cambrian explosion where those things are going to get consolidated, we're going to see complex adaptive bodies, and you get the explosion of the mind dimension. Okay, so that was our, my feeling was that we were going to do the Cambrian explosion equivalent or the mind Big Bang equivalent over the last 50,000 to 100,000 years when we went really from mostly behaving as primates to behaving as full modern persons, there was going to be a whole nother jump in 100 years or so. And so I was fascinated by that. That situated me to be more on the futuristic side of things. Um, I got interested in uh, the, some ideas about the singularity, uh, you know, the work by Ray Kurzweil initially, and actually it goes back to Graham Snooks and other people who've talked about this concept of the singularity. And, you know, I was very optimistic and excited um, and felt like our trajectory generally in the mid 2000s, uh, I felt like our trajectory was very positive in relationship to realizing that and the tree of knowledge pointed to that in a particular way. It's also the case that the tree of knowledge points to this as being potentially a very precarious moment because massive systematic change um, runs a heavy high risk of not being able to capture the order chaos dynamic correctly. And if you can't capture the order chaos change dynamic, well then systems spiral out of control and either become unbelievably rigid or become unbelievably chaotic, okay? So then in 2016, um, a series of life events happened so that I started to shift outside of the academy. Uh, I actually then in 2018 uh, started tracking Jordan Peterson. So Jordan Peterson uh, has exactly the same basic background that I have in terms of he's a clinical theoretical personality psychologist, which is my background and training. Mm-hmm. And I then saw the unbelievable wake of ca- ideological chaos that was then surrounding him. Okay, so he becomes a hotbed, Uh, you know, he has concerns in Canada about C-16 and the the language usage and language policing from his vantage point, as opposed to... That's a diagnostic manual, C-16? No, I'm sorry, C-16 is a bill that Canada put forward, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll give you a little more background. Canada, in its attempt to engage social justice in the proper way. Um, There were concerns by individuals, you know, of transgender, uh, transgender individuals, and they wanted pronoun usage to represent their rights. So if I trans uh, from a man into a woman, I wanted to be called a her. All right. And they actually then passed legislation 
uh, that said, yes, actually, you should do that. And Peterson basically was like, yeah, I'm okay with doing that probably, although it depends sort of on the person. Remember, he's a clinical psychologist. We clinical psychologists know that people's motives are not always pure, right. okay? And, and, but more concernedly, he was like, well, wait a minute. Are you actually legislating my thought here and my speech? Precisely, precisely. Okay. Well, so well, I well, listen, the, the evolution of language in the past, is, it's unprecedented except for, I think, in, in England, right, with the royal with the royals imposing a particular yeah, you know, I mean, ling linguistic uh, requirements. But, right. uh, you know, it's uh, a I mean, dangerous... outlying, uh, there are people that say that everyone should speak American in the United mm -hmm. States. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but right. but, but that, that, that's ridiculous. Uh, the, 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 not, not, my understanding of knowledge and its relationship to language and vice versa is that it has to be able to evolve naturally. Right. Otherwise, right. so, well, what are we doing? We're putting artificial constraints on something, and, and we have to be tolerant of new language. Popper taught us that. So, uh, yeah. So a anyway, the, the his interpretation, and you can dispute his interpretation, but it's basically now we're going to set a precedent so that the parliament in Canada, this case, can now legislate language based on social activist cause. Okay? That's what his concern was. So he stood up and said, I'm against it. All right? Well... But that meant for the people who were for it, you were then against the trans community. Yeah, that's, okay? a, that's a non sequitur. You know that. That's a fallacy. Well, right. I know that, but the system doesn't know that, and the people trying to get the bill don't know it, and voila, you have an explosion of a, of a uh, psychology professor on the conservative side of an issue where social justice activists are, are trying to push something through, and he stands up and says no. Well, that's an unbelievable, volatile explosion. Yeah. Okay. Unnecessary, that, too. We need to reform well, education so we teach logic and reason in the eighth grade before before math, before trig. Teach logic and reason first before you get any into any in-depth math, and then they'll get it. They'll get math better. They'll get their lives will be better. Logic and reason. We have to have those courses added. I'm all for, I'm all for logic and reason. Uh, so anyway, what happened to me then is I actually then was fascinated by Jordan Peterson. Both, I think he's a very interesting character, and even more so what his wake of controversy said about our current state, okay? Yeah. And then I tried to actually bring that controversy to my program so that we would witness on the sidelines and ask logic questions about it and say, hey, you know, what, what is the controversy here? Well, I mean, the, I don't want to get into too many details, but the, the short answer was that by doing that, there was a subset of students that were very potentially, you know, uh, frustrated with that. Sure. Um, and they had their narrative as to why, and I don't, I'm not here to, but it, it created significant tensions as a short well, answer. Uh, let, me, let me put it in short, in short language. You touched the third rail. <laughs> I touched the third rail. That's right. right? And, 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 and bounced myself back in, but I, I touched it in a way that says like, wow, this is really, I believe based on my own experience and I've seen in my first principles ways of thinking is like, this is really dangerous. OK, right. so how do we address the social justice? I'm a clinician uh, for uh, 25 years. I never took a dollar for my work. I did it all with the impoverished people, inner city, rural, you know, across the rainbow of human diversity. So Beautiful. my heart is a social justice heart. My first intellectual awakening is feminism. You know, that's just how I'm built. But it's also the case I'm a first principles, logic and reason science person. OK, and I'm not going to then just submit to some system that tells me from a, some authority you this is what morally true is and if you don't engage in it you're you know have a moral panic around you it's like right. you know that's the last thing where you're going to find me around so so now we get this t challenge and tension okay and that ultimately led me into the intellectual dark web you know the coin the, the term that eric Weinstein coins um, and rebel wisdom and a whole host of other these alternative medias um, and and meta modernism the sensibility of the thing that comes after postmodernism which I then realized that actually my whole theory this that weird cartoon thing behind me that's actually a meta modern artwork I didn't know it at the time but it's a sincere ironic representation of a theory uh, that transcends both modernist science and postmodern. Uh, justice concerns to give rise to an integrated pluralistic whole. Um, and that's really what I'm interested in and what I believe the sort of Enlightenment 2.0, next renaissance uh, kinds of stage that I think if, the, if we get the digital age right and we get the right, we can, you know, evolve out of the blue church and the red pill and into a, a new enlightened renaissance. Uh, that's what I hope for. Uh, and that's what I want to be a part of. Yeah, absolutely. So, 
in the time that you have created the tree of life uh, concept knowledge this, this, yeah yeah sure i keep misspeaking the, the tree <laughs> of knowledge uh world view do you have anything where you can say examples where you can say yeah that that changed because of my contribution do you have something like a feather in your cap what's your what's your brightest plumage if you will? um <laughs> well actually i mean i think that what's you know, I, it, there were lots of little things. I mean, th there was the yeah. system itself that, you know, now a lot of people know about, okay? But it, yeah. but no one else is applying it. So I can't say, you know, I, I think that's what's happening now, though, is that I found my people, as it were, mm -hmm. really, and especially ever since COVID. Right. So since COVID, what people are happening, you know, when I, over the last two years, as my family would tell you, um, as I got into following these things, I got more and more nervous. I was saying that, you know, the tree of knowledge tells you, as long as we do it right, we can really flourish but we're going to be going through a, voc a, 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 vic a vicarious system where there's vulnerability okay yeah. and now i learned as i really looked at the whole i obviously knew there was an, an environmental crisis but i didn't really have a full appreciation of the stacked high thin interdependencies of the current global situation uh, as somebody like daniel schmachtenberger will talk about and, now, and I believe that, you know, he and Jordan Hall really spell out that we, there's a lot of high-level risk. And if we continue on our current path, we will hit a wall before we fix it, okay? So there's a real deep transformation that needs to take place. Um, and, and when... Hmm. Let's check the settings here, see if we can get them back. Oh, Sorry, I lost a connection there. Go um, ahead. What the you, tree of? Go ahead. You started with the with the high risk, and we lost you uh, uh, yeah. as you were just okay. about to juxtapose. Yeah. So the tree of knowledge told me that we're going to go through a transition, uh, and now I was saying, oh my God, there's yes, just like it said, we may be tipping towards chaos, and we have so much work to do, and it's going to be an intergenerational jump. There are a lot of problems here. So I started talking about global civilization collapse uh, in 2018. That mm -hmm. became part of my, and my family was sick and tired of hearing about it. Greg's like, I'm actually really worried, people. My kids aren't going to grow up in the world. You know, I have three children. And everybody's like, oh, I mean, who can think about that, right? You know, it's like who, global civilization collapse, whatever. Who can do much about it? And I'm like, right. but I'm looking at a horizon out here, and I have a vision for how heaven, using it in Jordan Peterson's term of like on earth versus hell on earth can really look. And I can really see any one of those are possible. And if we make the wrong decisions now, we're in a very crucial joint point right now we have to all be working together and realize wake up that we can't keep doing the old thing or else it's going to go off a cliff so that's what i was saying well so COVID happens you know um and i think the number of people that are now really like oh my gosh there's these stacked interdependencies of our financial system our healthcare system our political system our medical system and experts may know about their little domains but experts don't know how to manage all of this and then we get overflowed by all of the different information ecologies, the mainstream media is trapped by old ideas and now hyper-polarized ideas. So our, our information ecologies are a nightmare. We have all of these different kinds of problems. So everyone's sort of waking up. So what I would point to is that there's a kairos of the moment here. And the tree of knowledge has been predicting this for 20 years at some level. It's been slapping me in the face. And now it's actually realizing in the lived experience of our meta-reality. And uh, so that's like, holy heavens. Boy, do we need a way to understand the meaning systems, what is true and good, quickly so that we can preserve our individuality, we can preserve our culture, and we create an appropriate metaculture that allows us to hone and coordinate. That's, so, a, that's what it tells us our challenge is. So you've come through this journey where your family was sick of hearing about it. There's a concern, I think it's a universal concern, uh, that the... Deus ex machina from the current <laughs> nightmare is going to be wearing a black hat, right? That's a and that's fear. Yep. So out of that that's fear, right. if I apply the principles that have guided my life, that's a motivation to channel all of that fear into creating something positive. And right. so, outside of your realm of psychology, into sociology into politics yep there are some un i think there's some unplugging that needs to be done there are some connections that exist in our society that are extremely unhealthy 
Yes. And I've been very vocal about corporations having too much influence on government. I've been very vocal and overtly so about fascism existing at both ends of, you know, communism is one form of fascism, corporatism is the opposite end. Right in the middle you have populism they're, and the fact that political They're both totalitarian. Parties, right, they're both totalitarian. It's just, does the state own the corporation or does the corporation own the state? It's the flip side of the same coin. It really doesn't matter to me who's, what you call these entities. But in the middle is pure populism, which our founding fathers told us was probably not the best route towards making group decisions <laughs> talk about chaos. Uh, yep. But nevertheless, somewhere in there is the epiphany that these things that we've been handed called political parties, Republican, Democrat, doesn't matter where society changes on that spectrum of, to, of, of fascism, uh, uh, whether we're leaning towards communism mm -hmm. or leaning towards um, total corporatism, right. those, those parties are going to survive. And they'll pick up their domains within those particular that particular realm on that larger political spectrum to keep people divided, to keep people separate on issues that don't really matter as much in the long term. What whether your grandchildren are going to have safe food, safe water, safe air, yep. right? That these things are secondary so whether you like this or like that whether you pro this or pro that you put on the republican you put on the democrat to me these are just labels another layer of control on the matrix um and the things that i would like to see unplugged would be the ability of corporations to determine the outcome of what we see in the media the ability of corporations to determine the outcome of elections the ability of corporations to determine the food that we eat the what we educate our children about the 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 the, the intrusion of the profit motive in, in a way that does not in any way lead towards leninism it doesn't lead towards right. trotsky it doesn't lead towards communism right. at all what it leads to is an informed and educated public and so this, the, we need to not only teach logic uh, and, and reason before we try to teach the higher maths, we need to teach civics. But every person in the country needs to understand and children need to be taught. You don't just have a responsibility to yourself. You have a responsibility to your family, your neighbors, everyone in your, in your county and state, everyone to, to, to participate in your own government. You have to be, not just go out and vote, but actually be an active participant. Go show up to the meetings and ask questions. Get comfortable. Teach your children to ask those questions of the people that are governing them. And know the difference between a public servant and a ruler. Uh -huh. and there's no distinction. There's the, the distinction between public service and politics and outright rulers is being lost and the, the people are taking power where they don't need to take power. They, they're, instead of having an, an influence, they're being, you know, um, a dic yep. they're dictating our lives. So Amen. we absolutely have to have meaningful reform. There's going to be change. There's going to be things that are plugged. There are going to be things that don't survive. Preserving our culture, to me, in my mind, no longer sounds conservative. It's but preserving those aspects of our culture to me sounds utilitarian and optimal. And thus the kind of thinking that we need to imbue in our children, uh, in our teens in particular. And don't yep. allow yourself to be capitalized upon, you know, my, my greatest concern is that the corporations have no more countries to grab natural resources from and they see us as their natural resource. Hmm. They, they're, they're mining our health. They're mining our ability to, to store and preserve their toxins for them. Um, mm. And mm. so, you know, if, if we have any say whatsoever, any influence on the way people are thinking about this, is you better make some friends across the aisle if you're a Republican and a Democrat, because those differences that they persist generation to generation, if you look at how different the Democratic Party is now from the 60s and how different the Republican Party is from the 60s, they're arbitrary labels. Every four to eight years, there's another set of platform that's, that's put together on the basis of what um, uh -huh. uh, Richard Nixon, Pat Roberts, no, no, who's the guy that ran Richard's, Richard Nixon's campaign? Uh, for, he, he was... Mm. He was Big on the, the talk show network. Not Henry Kissinger. Uh, wait, uh, uh, black hair. Uh, he had a sister. He was on all the big shows on 
the news. Mm. Uh, anyway, the, the mentality is we know how to win the election. We'll divide the country on issues and we'll take the bigger half. Mm, they, they've mm. been doing multivariate analysis on political issues ever since they figured this out, all the way back to Nixon's campaign. Um, mm. I wish I could remember the guy's name, but he said it's it the it's Southern. Yeah, the Southern. Well, that, Nixon had the Southern strategy, which was a definitive manipulation. He was of those huge kinds in of the issues. 80s. This guy was huge in the 80s. He was around the time Newt Gingrich was, you know, on all the talk circuits. I forget mm. his name. He had black okay. hair. I'm, I'm going to kick myself after the show. But anyway, the point <laughs> being. Uh, a legitimately, um, a, a legitimate politician to me is somebody who votes on the basis of their own personal principle matched with those of the people they represent, not matched with the, the corporations. We absolutely mm -hmm. need to limit the amount of money that from corporations that go, go into politics. That's step one. Step one is to limit that. We need to absolutely to redo campaign finance reform. The, the Democrats have learned how to get money from corporations now. That's why they're so different. That's why they're so rabid. And they're new. They're like the nouveau riche. The Republicans have been doing it forever and ever and ever, getting money from corporations, you know, one way or the other. And they're comfortable with it. And they know how to handle themselves in public when they get, you know, the, the party, the, the, the power of the Democratic Party comes from the top down. Do as the party says, or we won't support you because we're not going to get this money next year if you screw it up. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. not politics. That's obey. That's that. That's be, that's obedience. That's, that's submission to yep. somebody's agenda. So um, I have a discussion I want to have with you before we close out the show. But what I'd like to do is give you kind of a, a few minutes to close out your thoughts. Where can people find you? Where can people support your projects? What's your next thing coming? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, let me just echo some of what you said there. So um, sure. I, I really believe that, yes, I believe certainly in the United States, um, we have created political, uh, corporate institutional structures, uh, all part of Blue Church, and now they're so polarized that they're both horribly dependent upon each other and toxic in relationship to each other. Yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm a clinician, so I see this and, you know, some couples will come to me, you know, on the brink of divorce who, who just now have gotten a, a long history of bitterness and, and they're entangled and enmeshed and they're trying to separate and the kids, you know, what's happening to the children, but, but they're getting brutalized and manipulated by the hostile exchange. And that's, that's my metaphor for where we are, is that we're in the midst of a nasty di divorce that really can't get divorced because they need each other, um, but we're, the people are the children and we're getting brutalized. You know, uh, and so we need to realize that we're in a system where the parents, you know, the archetypal Republican male and the archetypal Democratic female should be dialectically in a good system, dialectically respecting each other, pushing each other in the best sort of way. And the balanced outcome, you know, is good children. And we're doing the exact opposite of that. Uh, so. Uh, so for me, the system is horribly broken. I like to think about myself. I used to say I'm sort of, I certainly lean left, uh, but the system's so toxic that really I'm a, uh, I, I used to say I'm into, more independent. Now I'm sort of meta-political, which basically is like, I'm going to stand above and beyond the horizon of the chaos and ask, well, where are we? Where's the future we want to go? And what is the morality that we want to use to ground those long-term visions, okay? And that's the ultimate system is a, that I built. It, while we talked about the tree of knowledge, uh, the thing behind me is the tree theory of knowledge, okay? The first branch of which is the tree of knowledge system. You know, it's all very complicated. Um, but the whole point of it is actually to build a scientific, humanistic, meta-psychology philosophy, all right, that guides us for the educational purposes of society toward the higher values that transcend culture and also preserve our cultural and individual uniqueness. Okay. Mm -hmm. The big three values that I emphasize are dignity, well-being, and integrity. Okay? And I argue that basically we want to build uh, societies that n are nested around this fractal um, and, and are organized as such to enhance and maintain those big three values. And they exist in tension with each other. And I, I, so, so that's the mission. And, and, and if we hold on to that guidepost and connect people with that kind of vision, I believe we will be able to transition through the chaos, balance order and chaos in relation, and build a complex adaptive system at the digital layer 
that respects the metacultural dimension into the cultural, into the individual, and down on through, and harmonizes with Earth. That's one of the reasons it's a garden, uh, both in terms of a nod to our mythic um, traditions around the Bible, like the Garden of a Tuart, or like Garden of Eden, uh, and it's also a statement about how we should relate to the natural world. Build your garden locally and globally. Um, and that's, those are the kinds of ideas that we need to be thinking about. So that's my pitch at the level of, okay, what does this all actually translate into? What are we actually thinking about? How do we step outside of the sort of institutional inertia, uh, corruption, and dangerous collapse that we might be facing? And how do we network together people that can see it to create an emergent collective intelligence uh, that would actually guide us and our children so we move in the right direction uh, for a much wiser future? So that's, that's my mission, and that is to guide systems, to be a part of a system that guides through the fifth joint point up into the 21st century. Um, so, you know, what I'm doing, I'm writing a book. Uh, so my next book is uh, basically updating my system. Uh, and sort of interesting in your title of Unbreaking Science, it essentially says, well, there's good reason the modernist scientific tradition did a lot of good things, okay, but it's actually broken at the level of psychology. And the reason is it didn't have the right way of thinking about mind, matter, uh, scientific knowledge relative to social knowledge. And that's actually, if you learn the tree of knowledge, it solves both of those issues. It solves mind versus matter. It solves social knowledge and scientific knowledge. It defines their interrelation. And thus it allows us to solve what I call the enlightenment gap uh, and create a synthetic philosophy of understanding scientific natural knowledge that can then be organized so we have a coherent vision rather than a fragmented vision. Um, so then I want to get that out, and then what you have, that shell, that you hone in on psychology, understand what human psychology is about, and extend the wisdom of psychotherapy to build socio-emotional -eco uh, economic class development. And what I mean by that is, what is our relational value? How do we show our true purpose? How do we create humanistic uh, environments that are emotionally healthy and afford an economic class where we can live? We really, uh, classic capitalism solved the first two layers of Maslow, generally. So most of us have our physical needs met. We have good biological control. We can be safe. We are going crazy at the level of belonging and esteem and meaning. Um, and that's, that's what we can, if we do it right, we can transition. And that has everything to do with actually kind of a social capital vision where we actually should be investing in our connection, our sense of brotherhood, our sense of meaning, our sense of appreciating the sacred and working together uh, to make the world a better place as public servants and as intellectuals and as just good people of the community uh, so that we see ourselves as part of a nexus, pre appreciating our autonomy and also uh, connecting to the greater good. So that's, that's my vision and hope. That's fantastic. Where can people find your information? Is that your poster that you have created or someone else's that you picked up what's that the, the oh yeah yeah no i you. yeah the poster that's that's my so yeah we're yeah. actually i have you can uh find me gregenricus.com is my home page uh cool. i have a built a society called theory of knowledge society you can email me uh at h-e-n-r-i-q-g-x well, we can put it in notes at uh, h-e-n-r-i-q-g-x at jmu.edu uh, and then I'll dialogue with you. And we're about ready to build a theory of knowledge web page. Uh, I've been recently making a lot more podcasts. I may start my own podcast, although that's what everyone's doing. Um, and uh, yeah, my goal now is to connect, connect with the leading edges of culture and get the mission out there that we have a lot of work to do. There's a lot of danger and fear, yes, but there's also a lot of hope. And if we do this right, the 21st century could be a very bright thing. Yeah, I would certainly hope so. Well, listen, it's been a, a, an honor and a pleasure to get to know you. It's been an honor and pleasure to have you on the, on the podcast. Um, we're going to have you back for sure as these things develop right. and as they roll out. You know, the, the pathologies, the sociological pathologies that uh, are threatening to take root. Um, we, we need That's to... right. I haven't talked about the fact. I am a clinical psychologist, so I can speak about psychosocial pathologies in quite a bit of a, and that's absolutely what we are seeing. I can we dialogue about that. We definitely need to enumerate them. We need to put names on them. We need to talk about the actors, the, the, the people who are incentivized to, to uh, or capitalizing upon, upon them. Yep. Uh, and, and we need to call them out, and then we need to say, that door is closed. We've bent down that road. <laughs> Didn't turn out good. Let's, let's see what other doors might be open. And you've certainly done that today 
Greg, I really appreciate it. So, listen, um, I will post uh, his email address, uh, Greg's email address, as well as uh, the website that he mentioned and so on in the comments. Um, but you can certainly expect to see him here again. And also, he's been inter he's been on the podcast circuit a little bit. I would encourage you to find him on other podcasts and and look him up if you're into uh, what what he, all, everything that we've talked about today. Um, there's so much that's available to us that we're not using. Um, so please do avail avail yourself of the insights and the wisdom and the direction that that Greg uh, wants us to go in. And I'm very interested in your society. Frankly, I would love mm -hmm. to talk with Great. you. Great, I'd that. be happy to. Yeah, happy to talk with you. That'd be wonderful. Right on. So we're going to close out now. Thank you. Come back sometime. Thank you. Take care.